So we're a few minutes late. Um, welcome to day two. I hope that the day one was fun for you. Um, a lot of people asked yesterday what's the official hashtag of the conference. So it's HIPCON18 or just HIPCON. If you tag HIPSpace, it will be fine as well because we don't have uh, HIPCON as a separate uh, social network channels. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, don't forget when you leave the conference today to leave the beacon because as I said yesterday it will self-destruct, it won't, but uh, it would be great if you'd leave them here because you won't be able to use them uh, outside of the venue. Uh, we will have, uh, how many talks, Igor, today? You don't know the number? A lot? Okay. So until 6 p.m. Uh, tonight, uh, we'll have a short uh, closing ceremony, so I would like to invite you to stay because we will present some of our co-workers from the region. Uh, there will be a lot of interesting stories. It will be short, maybe five to ten minutes. Then we have dinner, then it will be some uh, music in the venue, so please stay if you have time. Uh, we are continuing in the Red Room with Igor. I hope you had fun with him yesterday. Yes or no? No? Igor, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, second, uh, the third important thing actually is that we will uh, have uh, the prize giving uh, during lunch. I said that on the rock stage as well, but if you signed up, uh, please, please be around uh, time for lunch. Igor, please, if you'd present Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Hey. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, guys. So thank you for coming to Belgrade. Thanks, man. Um, just want to ask you a few questions. Um, I heard about that you live rock climbing. I'm very into rock climbing, so <laughs> you'll probably see a couple <laughs> photos. Apologies, it's an obsession. But what about marine biology? Yeah, blast from the past. So I kind of deterred a little bit in my career. One of the deterrences was uh, I was really in, I grew up on an island, so I was mm -hmm. really into the ocean. I kind of had an obsession with dolphins and Jacques Cousteau. And so I thought I was going to go into marine biology. And then I realized when you're sitting in a lab, just pipetting things into little trays, it's not that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Software was way more fun. <laughs> okay, so let's hear about it. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Are we excited for the day? I feel like everyone basically is pretty tired right now, so I'm, my job is to wake you all up. Are you guys excited to hear some talks? Hopefully at least mine. Yes? Yay! Okay, cool. I got a reaction. Awesome. Um, so I am here to talk to you about um, something that is, yeah, in the morning probably not the most exciting topic, but um, I've actually found it to be a pretty intriguing thing that has happened to me over the course of my career, which is diving into management, um, really sort of the notion of not just developing software for as an individual on a team, but really kind of starting to think about leading teams, leading people, having bigger and bigger impact. Um, management as a practice is really a force multiplier of every effort you do. And hence, it's kind of required when you, when you start to want to do bigger and bigger things in this world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and real quick, brief introduction about myself. Who am I? Uh, my name is Courtney Hempel. I am sort of coming to you by way of San Francisco and New York. I work for a company called Carbon5. I am a partner in what we call a technical lead. So we have five offices in the United States. We're a consulting company. We get to work with all variety of uh, crazy initiatives. And I'll talk a little bit about them in my presentation to give you kind of some context on the work that I've been involved in. Um, but first, let's talk about management. Um, so I'm, you know, not, I've kind of grown a healthy disdain for management over the course of my time, mostly because I would see people that effectively kind of looked like this. Um, no offense to those that have really nice suits and ties, but it was always this feeling of watching these people roam around these companies, and they were always in meetings, they were talking on the phone, and I was like, what exactly are you doing? What is your output? What are you creating? Um, and one thing I always loved about software was I could sit down and I could sit at a keyboard and I could produce something that I felt was valuable to someone in this world. I could see them use that software, I could see them respond to that software, I could see myself break that software <laughs> and fix it. And it just felt like I had this dramatic impact. I could have agency, I could have autonomy, I could produce things that people loved, and I could learn from that. And I didn't really understand what these other people were doing. What exactly are you doing in those meetings? What are all those calls for? And I just really didn't have a concept for it until I started working on larger and larger teams. 
And what I started to recognize was, as much as it is really fun to be able to travel the world and sit down and code and still make a living, which is great, uh, in order to make a bigger impact on this world, in order to kind of grow as really a coder, you have to work with other people. You learn from them, you recognize that you can create bigger platforms, bigger software products, and you really need to be able to collaborate with them. And in order to collaborate, you have to do this thing, which is effectively management. So why do we manage? We manage because we can have greater impact. It is the force multiplier of our efforts. So when you learn how to be a great manager, you basically are able to amplify the work that you do in greater and greater ways. Um, and it really becomes its own practice. You really can kind of learn wonderful skills in order to manage better. And this is something that I'm gonna try to impart today. There's some skills that I have learned over time. And I'd like to share some of those. Um, they were specifically helpful for me. I hope they're helpful for you. But this is a little bit about my career. So, whoop, I think I'm one behind. Um, this, there we go. So this is my path in software. Um, I started out, I did not graduate with computer science degree. As you heard, <laughs> I had a detour. So I graduated in biology. Um, but when I graduated, I took a couple classes in computer science, and I found that it was really interesting. I really liked it. So I had a friend that had moved to Silicon Valley right during the first dot-com boom, and he was starting a company, and he figured, what can I sell that's got great margins and is easy to ship? And it was posters. <laughs> so we started allposters.com. So I was uh, one of the first three people on the team. I had really not deployed production software yet. And so I learned to do so really kind of baptism by fire. So I broke a lot of stuff and I learned a lot during that time. And after that, I started working for random companies. Um, so I was a freelance consultant. So really kind of independent, but learning a lot, kind of diving in and out of different code bases, working with different clients. Um, and I really enjoyed the process, and I started to recognize that software development was what I wanted to do with my career. But it wasn't until I got to Carbon 5 and I started pair programming with a group of people that just were vastly advanced in their skills beyond what I knew. Um, and pair programming just amplified what I knew um, faster than anything else I'd ever done. So I sort of started to see what mentorship looked like, what great technical leadership looked like, and then I started to be able to replicate that as a technical leader for some of the clients we were working with. So early on, these were startups. Um, many of them were brand new, so there was no technical team. So we were the technical team for the companies. Some of these went on to become pretty well known. Um, some of them were like healthcare companies that became um, Grand Rounds, some of them were Square, so a payment system if you're familiar with it. Um, we've worked with Stitch Fix. And so over time, the projects became bigger and bigger and the teams became bigger and bigger. And I started to recognize there's these other skills that are important. Um, oftentimes they're termed as soft skills. I kind of hate the term because the skills are critical and very important. But we are now working with companies of all sizes. And so what I enjoyed out of consulting was it's pretty fun to be able to kind of dive into different companies and see great management and see great leadership and also see how other people do things. There's all sorts of processes used at all sorts of companies. I think all of us are familiar with some of the tools that manage our workflow as developers like Jira or Pivotal Tracker. What you start to recognize is that there's all sorts of other tools that you can think about using when you have to organize with a greater business. Um, so talking a little bit about that, um, and I kind of said this before, but truly great general management is what makes all of our lives easier. It's what makes the work that we do see the light of day and either become successful or not. And being able to be a mentor at a company is actually a really empowering outcome. So, Different from shipping code, you're not getting to see sort of the binary result of your work, but being able to work with others and amplify their skills is something that can be a very powerful outcome if you're interested in it. And the interesting thing that I'm seeing, at least in the worlds that I am in, which is San Francisco and New York, and kind of had heard a little bit about this talking with people at this conference, it's really tough right now because there's a gap in available, wonderful software developers. I mean, the great thing for us is like the market is super hot right now. So you all have tons of opportunity, which is fantastic. But what's tough is that there's been a real change in the way our organizations operate. So we used to work in much larger teams. Um, we are now working in 
teams that are grouped smaller, but the, the two pizza team is now sort of a common dynamic. And if a company isn't already there, they're probably moving there. So where we used to be large teams, sort of centralized management, we didn't need as many technical leaders. What we're finding now is we need a lot of wonderful technical leaders in each one of these domains um, because we have smaller and smaller teams, we have more of them, and they have to coordinate with each other. So there's a real gap right now because the reality is there's no way to just get these skills from a book or a management school. There's not a GSB um, or a business school for technical leaders. And you can't just go onto the internet and log into Stack Overflow and like query for some personal problem that you're having with a direct report you have. So it's really tough. Generally, these skills are on the job training that you get. And it can be very scary when you go from someone that has never had a direct report to all of a sudden having humans looking to you for ways in which to amplify their skills and to become better at their job. Um, so it, it, you know, for me, when I first started doing this, I was like, oh, this is what it's going to look like. I'm going to develop, and then I'm going to lead teams, and it's going to be really cool. They're all going to follow me, and it's all going to be easy and great. And then eventually I'll get up to, like, the boss. But the reality and the way that it actually feels is this. You're not standing on the top supported by all these people. When you first start doing this, basically all the responsibility, ergo all the stress, kind of just falls down on your head. So you can feel this immense pressure of this pyramid above you. And the things that you need to do in order to alleviate some of this fall down to great management skills. So I wanted to point out that not everyone needs to manage in the traditional sense of management, meaning you have direct reports and you have to be responsible for someone else's career development. There are a ton of different paths to getting into technical leadership, and all of them are options. I would also say that each one of these circles represents a real need at a company, and you can bounce in and out of them. So I know technical leaders at companies that still write code. It's, there are dangers to that, but you can still do this. So it's not a dead-end path. Going into management, trying it out, seeing if you have the interest and the capacity to lead people, it doesn't mean that, that you're stuck doing that for the rest of your life and you're never going to get to code again. Um, so just know that there are many different paths and all of them are available to you. And the other thing to know is you already have a lot of these skills. As software developers, we've gotten really good at these things on the left. You know, things like pairing with others, things like writing stories for, for software development and estimating them and prioritizing them. So we have a lot of experience in great functional tools and tactics in order to get work done. And many of them are applicable to these things on the left that I'm going to talk about today. So the great news is, is you have the foundations. It's just learning how to kind of like twist the frame into something that is oriented a little bit more wider in scope. And they kind of fall into three buckets. And the first one is pretty important, communication. Clear, concise communication with others makes work go faster. It's more efficient. And generally, you're going to be able to move initiatives forward better if you can clearly communicate what the needs are. Uh, second is really just kind of recognizing the business and the end customer. Oftentimes, you can isolate yourself from that when you're in the code or you're in the details. But scoping out and understanding what is the bigger impact on others in this company and generally to our customers in the world. It's really important for you to start to understand that. And then finally, this notion of mentorship um, or leadership or authenticity. This is the hardest one. This is all wrapped up into a lot of psychology and all of these other things. And you end up reading these books that you're like, really, is this on my table? I'm reading like the, the way to yes. But it, some of this psychology is really important to kind of understand when you are working with other people and having to coordinate and collaborate and negotiate. So the first one I'm going to talk about um, is critical. And for me, was probably the one that I recognized if I got good at it, it's going to make all the other stuff a lot easier. Um, and I want to give a hat tip to someone that gave me a lot of these tips. Um, it was through a general management school called Harrison Metal. Um, it's by a fellow named Michael Deering. He's based in San Francisco, so unfortunately, he doesn't have like worldwide classes that he gives. But if you find yourself on a trip to San Francisco, I highly re recommend looking it up. A lot of these tools are, are from that class. Um, and it really was something that was, it was accessible to me. It wasn't some you know, two-year-long business course. It was general tactics that I could use to get better at these specific skills. One of the first people that he introduced me to 
was this woman named Barbara Minto, and she's kind of like, for me, a, a little bit of a modern-day hero. She was the first woman that graduated from the Harvard Business School class. So at that time, Harvard Business School was all male, and even for this first class, they sort of kept the women separate, and the women had to go across the bridge, across the river to even get to the school. So she was part of the first graduating class. She was also the first woman at McKinsey, um, and that's where she developed this notion of the pyramid principle. So as a developer, it's really nice to have patterns of thinking when you're working through complex projects. And you can kind of do a similar thing when you have complicated messages to deliver. And so as technical leaders in an organization, the kind of messaging that you have to deliver is really complicated for those that aren't technical. And so understanding the best ways to communicate your message in order to state your solution to a problem or a decision that your team has made that you need the business to buy into, whether or not you're replatforming to cloud to save money, whether you are going to a different language stack, uh, whether you're doing a rewrite somewhere, being able, you're going to be in the details and know all of it. If you throw all those details out first, you're going to lose everyone in the room. So her philosophy is get to the point fast. So state the decision and then outline the detailed arguments underneath it. So these are ways for you to clearly articulate the decision that you need to have made and then the details to support your argument. Um, another thing that she comes up with, and I use this a lot for like emails, is situation, complication, question and answer. So the theory for this is Again, clearly state the situation in a way that is accessible to all and is a kind of clear statement of fact. Um, so everyone can get behind it because you're, you're kind of just stating the reality. This is the situation we're in. Correct? Everyone agree? And then you state the complication as you see it from your point of view. So introducing, again, some information that is details that might augment that situation and or show the complication. Usually what happens after those two things are presented is a rhetorical question comes. So sometimes you can state it and write it in the email. Sometimes it's just obvious, given what you've already said. But it clearly allows people to understand what you're trying to get to and provide an answer or at least give an opinion. Um, or you can present your own answer. So this is just a nice systematic way to be able to go through making a clear argument, particularly when you are in some heavy-duty details that not a lot of other folks within an organization can buy into or understand immediately. So another form of communication is feedback. Um, this can be one of the hardest things when you first start managing people, is you start to have one-on-ones. You start to get feedback. A lot of the time, the feedback is negative. <laughs> a lot of the time, you've got people on your team that you're hearing things, and you're like, there's no easy solution for what you're telling me. And you can get into a place where it's really frustrating, but you don't want to be frustrated with the people that effectively are there to do the work, right? Your role, now that you are managing bigger teams, is not necessarily to do the specific work. It is to clear the path so other other folks can do great work. So feedback can be a hard one because it is both extremely hard to give productive feedback, but it's also really hard to get productive feedback. So we had an opportunity working with a woman named Kim Scott. Um, we actually did a project with her, and she wrote a book uh, named Radical Candor, kind of a silly name. But she came up with this really nice two-by-two two matrix that sort of as a logical person is kind of a nice way to understand how you are giving feedback to the people that are reporting to you. So you have your one-on-ones. Ideally, you're having them you know, once a week or once a month, depending on kind of the situation that you've got. It's important to understand that you need to care clearly about the people that are on your team. But if you care so deeply that it's hard for you to give them challenging feedback, you kind of fall into this quadrant in the top left where you are being very empathetic, but it's not helping them in their career, right? They have clear work that they can do. They're smart. They have a wonderful capacity. You know, they know your organization. They know the product. They can do a lot on this team. But if you are just giving them the nice words, they're never going to be able to level up in their skills. So her argument is really try to challenge directly, but also be empathetic. Oftentimes, what I see most, honestly, is when management gets taxed by a deadline that's coming up. There is a date, there's a lot of work to be done, people are kind of going crazy, and you are stressed because ultimately you are responsible for the delivery of this thing. 
But what ends up happening is that you start challenging directly everyone on your team, and you lose empathy for the position that they're in, which is very similar to the position you're in. They're stressed, right? They know just as well as you do that there's a tight deadline coming up. So you can wind up in this obnoxiously aggressive category, and you really got to help yourself steer back, particularly in those situations, to keep your team motivated to continually work towards this deliverable that you have. So for me, this has been a nice framework. And it's also sort of important to note that you kind of have your own perception about how you're giving feedback. Oftentimes, the people that are reporting to you have a really different perception about how they're hearing your feedback. So calibrating against how they're hearing it can be a really helpful thing as well. So sort of checking into them, how's the feedback that I'm giving you, and kind of putting it against these quadrants is, is an important check to, to make. And then retrospectives. How many folks here run these on their teams? Do you know reflections? Awesome. Okay, that's a pretty good set of the room. I personally feel and have had feedback from others that this is one of the power tools in your chest for management. Every single week, getting a calibration on your team's temperature, how are things going, what went wrong, how might we fix it. You know, it's sort of continual postmortems happening. Oftentimes, though, we've been in a situation where a team can just consistently be struggling, struggling with interpersonal dynamics, struggling with understanding of what it is, why are we even doing this? This doesn't make sense to me. So what we found is like it's nice to scope out at certain milestones in the project and kind of understand how does this whole team reflect against the work that we're actually trying to do. So I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Daniel uh, Pink's Drive, the book. It's really this notion of being able to understand your purpose, having, autonomous, having autonomy and agency are the things that drive people to do great work. And so part of what this is, is something that we created called the Product Dartboard. It's free, it's online, it's productdartboard.com. But it's a way to sit down with your team and say, are we all aligned on the product that we're trying to build? Do we feel that we are all debating and deciding well together? Do we feel like we understand why we're doing the work that we're doing? And what you'll find is that there's some interesting results that happen. So everyone completes this independently, and when you get the results at the end, you can kind of start to see that there might be sort of large deltas between some people's perceptions of how they are on these dimensions and other people's. And if, when there's very big differences between the team, it sort of shows that there's a little bit of work to be done. So these can be around things like roles and responsibilities. If people are sort of clobbering each other because everyone sort of thinks that their responsibilities are overlapping. If you can clear that up, oftentimes that sort of unlocks the team to be working a little bit better together. Um, all right, so moving into the next one. This is really around business results. So we all understand that the business needs to be successful, but sometimes we can kind of lose sight of that because we're in the details. So really being able to scope out and recognize that at the end of the day, you are doing this for an end customer. Maybe this end customer is internal because you're developing internal APIs. You still have a developer out there somewhere that is using your API. So some of the things that I've been uh, interested in either developing for Carbon 5, but also we've done this with some of our clients, um, are goals. So Andy Grove was um, one of the founders of Intel. Amazing human has come up with um, some really great ways to think about management. And one of the ways was something called OKRs, which stands for Objectives and Key Results. So this is a way to kind of frame when you've got lots of different people doing lots of different things, how all of them can align to make sure you're moving in the same direction. If you've got a bunch of people on a boat and everybody's paddling in a different direction, you're going to be kind of not going anywhere. So um, John Doerr worked for Andy Grove, and he brought these to Google. Google tends to just filter everything out into the valley. So you see a lot of companies that are using this now. And you know they're basically a way. He's got a great quote. And it's around this notion of being able to kind of minimize your work you're doing to only do the stuff that really matters. He says, the art of management lies in the capacity to select from the many activities of seemingly comparable significance, the one or two or three that provide leverage well beyond the others and concentrate on them. So it's a really good piece of advice, particularly when all of us have this all the time. You're just doing a lot of stuff. Um, so here's a couple things to think about when you're looking at objectives and key results. 
One, try to make them first at the company level, then at the group level, then at the individual level. We found that doing this in one-on-ones can be really helpful for finding out where people want to develop their skills in their career. So having independent goals can be really um, helpful for individuals that you're, are reporting to you. Also, generally, objectives should be pretty ambitious. So they, they say kind of set them uh, beyond what you think is possible around the 70% point. This is just to ensure that you're not kind of like sandbagging yourself and, and getting everything in. Um, another thing, not too many, so Andy Grove's prior point. And then make sure they're time bound. So don't have them be like a year long. This is sort of the same thing as agile development, right? Keep them short, show that you've got results, and then get to the next one. And then one of the gotchas, actually two gotchas, um, never tie them to bonus or comp. So particularly with individuals, if they're not hitting their objectives, it doesn't necessarily not mean that they're not valuable to the company. So, and the other thing is software developers are so smart. All of you here are incredibly bright. You'll just gamify the system if you know this is tagged to comp um, or salary. And then finally, in terms of the ambitious thing, I see this happen a lot of like bigger companies. Oftentimes making something ambitious means that the quality will go down if everyone is just going for this goal of a release that is highly ambitious. So your quality will suffer if all you're thinking about is that final goal. So always keep into consideration achieving those goals, but keeping and maintaining sustainable quality. So we have found that you're going to work with all kinds of developers in your career. Some of them are going to be unbelievably bright and super academic, and they're capable of doing research and coming up with solutions for really, really tricky things. At the end of the day, though, when we're delivering software as a team, you have to be thinking about your customer. So hiring and balancing out the developers on your team to understand the customer and have empathy for the customer is really important. Um, otherwise, you can kind of get in these twirls of trying to find the best solution for the problem when truly the simple solution for the problem is what the customer really wants. So some things to keep in mind, there's a, you know, really an understanding objective in most companies now for for developers to own their code end to end. And part of that is to understand when you're releasing a feature into production that you are understanding the results of that release. Um, so really monitoring it from the moment that you start development on it all the way to releasing it. So test your code. Test it in production as the user. If you've developed a feature, particularly one that's pretty complex, try it out as a user. At least do the 10 minute step of walking through that feature as a customer. If you are you know, well advanced in your testing regime and you've got a great DevOps team and SRE, you know, make sure you're doing these canary tests. Make sure that you're releasing and testing and finding results. Also, know the difference between before you release something and the after. So capture baseline and then see your results. This is how you learn. If you're not doing this, you actually don't really know the results of the work that you're doing. Um, and if you're you know, managing a team and leading a team, help to put these things into place. This is a cultural value that you can impart on your team. And trust me, this is absolutely the, probably the most efficient way to deliver software. And then finally, postmortems are really helpful. You're going to fail. You're going to have something that blows up. Everybody has it on every single team. There's no getting around it. Learning from those are the best moments of cohesion of a team and for the learning of your team. So have a postmortem, but make it blameless. Don't be like, Fred really messed up. Let's all point the finger at him. Fred probably did mess up, but everybody is a collective group. And so make sure that Fred knows that someone else is going to mess up next week. And so let's support Fred, figure out what happened, and make sure that it doesn't happen again. So share those learnings around. So I really hope there's going to be a day where this slide doesn't have to exist, <laughs> but diversity matters. Um, it clearly matters a lot. And it's not just because we want to all you know, have a bunch of different looking people in the room. It's because we need different mindsets. We need to know different frames of views. We need to know different backgrounds and kind of how they might approach a problem. If we don't have this, we are not going to be creating robust solutions. The good news is, is that it also matters for the bottom line. So this is a report just came out, McKinsey 2018, 366 public companies, and these are the results. And it's pretty dramatic, right? 15% better performance for gender diversity, 35% for ethnic diversity. And the great news is it's also for your profits. So this is down to the EBITDAs, 8% in the United States, 3.5% in the UK. It sort of makes me happy because I'm like, look, it really does matter. But how can you make an impact on this? Um, one of the things to consider is we all have biases. 
we evolved to have biases. It was very important for us when we were going through evolution to have systems thinking that was very snap response, so that when we were getting inputs of all sorts of data to our brains, the sun is shining, the trees are blowing, there's a tiger in the woods running at me. We need a snap response to run. So that's systems one, and we need biases so that we can clearly get through all of those inputs quickly. And we also need systems two thinking when we have the time and consideration to work through a tricky problem. But systems one thinking is oftentimes the culprit in implicit bias. So some of the things to do on your team to ensure that you're trying to manage against everyone's natural bias that we just have um, is first and foremost, when you're hiring, get outside of your comfort zone. Go to the places that you don't normally go. Go to the places where there's not all the people that look like you. So step outside, you know, go to meetups that you might no not normally go to. Don't always go to meetups at night because people that are parents are not gonna be there. So the pipeline problem is a problem, but it just means you need to take extra effort to hire a more diverse candidate by going to places so you're opening up the wide universe of potential candidates. Once you get these candidates in, make sure that you have clear rubrics. There's a ton of research that shows from the very moment that we see a resume, that someone steps into our offices for an interview, we make, within the first five seconds, a snap judgment, and then we tend to spend the next hour just finding evidence to confirm our judgment. So try not to do that by having very clear qualifications for a candidate that are applicable to the job so that you can compare candidate one and candidate two equitably. And then also use this for career progression within the company so that people know what's the difference from mid-level developer, developer, developer level one to developer level two. So people understand what they need to do to progress. Um, also, this is something that has helped me in my career. I always was very vocal about what I wanted to learn and what I wanted to do. So people would find these stretch projects. So something that had you know, things that I hadn't done before, but I had a group of people around that I could ask questions of. Those stretch projects allow my skill set to grow dramatically. So identify people and what they want to do and find stretch projects for them. Um, and then finally, create an inclusive environment. So ensure that you have a space where People that are brand new mothers, they have a room to go to to breastfeed. They have a place that they can go to find quiet time. Um, also, make sure the actual physical environment, meaning you know the art that's on the walls, it's not uh, that it is inclusive. It's inclusive of people's different backgrounds and religions and all of these things. Celebrate um, everything that people come from. So let people bring their culture, their backgrounds into that space so that everyone can have a sense of belonging there. This will definitely help with attrition. Um, making people feel like they actually belong in a space is very important to keep them in that space. So this is the hardest one. Um, you know, this is one that typically is associated to leadership. Uh, motivation is... It's a hard thing to understand, and there is no one hat trick to it, but these are some of the things, I'm kind of running through here because I know I'm going long, um, to consider when you're trying to be getting into that place of leadership. So the first one is mentorship. So mentorship sort of comes along three axes. There's mentorship to those that are not as far along in their, in their career as you are. There's also mentorship with others that are at your same plane. I have seen, you know, I've got an amazing piece of advice for people that are at their same places in the career as I am through meetups, Slack groups, you know, dinners that you go to. Find these people, they're gonna be fantastic in helping you in your career. And then also, you know, find people that are further along than you. So it's sort of like three axes that you have to consider. Psychological safety. So this is critical. Um, the psychological part is kind of a misnomer. It's really just allowing people to feel like they can try things out at a company and they're not going to get fired for it. So allowing people to have that sort of like capacity to take on some risk, A, it helps your company innovate. B, it helps them feel that they have agency in their job and they can kind of go after their purpose. Um, and in order for you as a manager to ensure that this is, doesn't sort of take down the whole ship, you need to provide them a sense of guides and guardrails. What are the things that you can put into place to ensure that they're not going to kind of blow the entire company up? So there's gonna be a certain set of stories or features or product initiatives that are gonna fall under that acceptable risk category. And you really need to give people the opportunity to just go for it. Because even if they mess up, you know, you can roll back. There was a canary deployment, you just sort of reroute it. That's acceptable risk. There are gonna be other things that are gonna be of a high 
better, like a higher degree of impact on the organization if they go wrong. And people need to understand what those things are. So those are ones where you need to have a higher degree of protection um, so that they don't fall off the cliff and die. And then finally, this is, this is one where it's like, of course, but this is the hardest one. Coming into work each and every day when you're stressed, when you have a lot of things on your plate, sometimes it can just be really hard to be authentic, um, to come in and being able to just be a human at work. This can oftentimes be a problem too when people are, they're very ambitious, they really wanna do good work, oftentimes they can fall outside of this realm of what people tend to call authentic leadership. And these are things like staying humble. You know, maybe you just got a big promotion and you're feeling top of the world. If you kind of bolster that out across the company, it can actually turn people away from you. So having values and walking the walk and talking the talk, those are two different things. Like you want to make sure that you are representing your values and the actions that you take. And people will see this and notice this and be drawn to you. And if you deter from this, people will start to be like, mm, that's a little hypocritical. That doesn't feel like they're being very authentic here. So if you're going to hold yourself to those high values, you have to act in interest of those values if you want your team to act in the interest of those values as well. All right, and finally, pitfalls. Um, it's going to happen to all of us. Nobody gets away from these. Some of the common struggles, so I've seen this happen. You're really stressed. You kind of just want to go back to the happy place that you know, which is code. It can be very dangerous to go and just dive into code and ignore all of the chaos that's happening around you. But it is the easiest thing to do. So just know it when you're doing it and try to back out of it. Also, getting caught in the complexity. So a lot of the time, it gets really exciting. There's some big thing happening. You talk to someone in your mentorship circle that said, oh yeah, I just tried out you know, this new reactive programming thing. You should totally try it. And so you go and you present it and, and it's gonna cost a lot to the organization. Make sure that you're understanding the complexity that you're bringing in. And also don't go running, chasing the shiny pretty technical things. Make sure that they make sense for the team and for the business. And then finally, this is sort of back to the last slide, you know, just understand that ego is a thing, right? You are always bringing yourself, your id, your ego to the organization. Don't come with a bunch of pet agendas. Do your best to not be condescending. Um, and understand more than anything that your ability to work with others in the company is probably going to make your job easier and is the best opportunity to advance in your career. So final thoughts to leave you with. Uh, management is the opportunity to help people become better people. Practice in that way, it's a magnificent profession. So it's not for everyone, it's not the only path, but if you're interested in it, it is a wonderful way to work. It's a wonderful outcome to see when more and more people are getting excited about the work that they do. So thank you so much. Um, I would love to get your feedback on the talk. I'm sorry I went a little over. I'll have these slides online, so if you're interested in any of these tools and techniques and whatnot, either come find me at the conference or um, you can go to my Twitter at chempel and I'll post the slides afterwards. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of the day.